Hi, everyone. It is Lindsay Baker with the Action Hour, and I'm here with one of my favorite guests, Craig C. Downer, who is an ecologist, and we're going to talk about the Andean Mountain Taper. But before we do, we want to acknowledge 9-11 and this, the victims of 9-11 and the brave people who fought and diverted the plane and saved lots of lives that day. And we want to remember them. They will never be forgotten. So we did want to take a moment to just think of them. So let's take 30 seconds of silence. Thank you. Okay, Craig, thanks for being on the show. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And today I have to say what we're gonna be talking about. I never heard of tapers, but apparently they're in the horse family. Is that correct? Uh, well, no, they're in the taper family, but they're in the, the order that includes the tapers and rhinos and horse, all the horse-like animals. So there's three ex uh, extant uh, existing families in that order there were um, other families that have since become extinct but that's a little too complicated to go into now it's really a fascinating and ancient order and they're a very important order they bring a lot of balance and they're like gardeners wherever they go they they build the soils and they seed the plant so uh, some of them call Maybe it. Maybe let's jump in right there. I want, let's jump in right there with the word seed. Now you had told me that it's extremely important because they're a seed species and we want to explain what that is. And then Maybe you can talk about, I know people probably have heard of keystone species. Maybe you can talk first about seed species and then get into what is a keystone species and why do we care? Oh. Yeah, the, a keystone species is a species that has a major effect at maintaining the integrity of an ecosystem or life community. And the mountain taper is a keystone species for the northern mid to high elevation Andes. So these, this is a fabulous area that has some of the, mo the greatest biodiversity of uh, species of plants and animals uh, in the world. And that... Um, the fact that they are up there in the headwaters of the Amazon, maintaining that living sponge by uh, seeding many, you know, dispersing the viable seeds of many plants, uh, means that their restoration also can be used to restore many areas where they've been uh, wiped out by hunting or habitat destruction. They can be used to uh, and, and that's true of all the all the the five species of of tapers that re, uh, remain in the world. But the yeah the mountain taper has been endangered uh, ever since uh, 1994. It's been declared endangered by the World Conservation Union Species Survival Commission, and I belong to that. And I wrote the action plan and species description for the the taper specialist group uh, now we're going to get into that in a little while and we want you to walk us through the plan it's always great when we bring information to the public to say that there is a plan in, that could be a viable plan that could be used and not only you wrote this plan but you were peer reviewed so it's been yeah. scientifically tested out and in fact well getting the whole plan in into effect is where all the testing and scientific data will come in because certainly there's a lot of research that needs to be done there and you'll go through that with us but yeah. we want to kind of just go back and maybe talk about how this animal let's talk about how they became how they got to the point where they're almost extinct and let's show this slide here where this is going back you can maybe you know recall if you can how long ago this yeah, uh, well, now and the like, difference uh, now. Go this ahead. Was from the 1997 uh, taper action plan, for at that time we were only aware of four species of taper, uh, but uh, since then the Malayan taper has also been and the Baird's taper or Central American taper have also been declared endangered, 
and I believe the lowland taper is now threatened. So there, the situation is growing worse because of course there's more people and more destruction of the forest and more hunting of these animals. So the, the two main causes are the destruction of their habitats and, their, and just hunting them directly to, uh, to eat them or to tan their hides or to use their parts for folklore medicine. Uh, so it's a very serious problem and we have to uh, have public education and get people to realize how vitally important these animals are to maintaining and restoring the Earth's ecosystems. That's what can balance out our atmosphere and our waters and our soils. And these are ancient presences. They go back many millions of years. Matter of fact, they often call tapers living fossils because they go back so many millions of years. I think to give people a good background of what we're talking about, it might be good to show some a couple of movie clips that I think are phenomenal. Yeah. Why don't you just give us a quick, um, well, let's just jump in and then we'll talk about it between the two of them. Yeah, okay. In remote parts of the Andes, there still exists a very rare animal, the mountain tapir. One of the main threats to the habitat in Sangai is the Frisian cow, which is kept by the locals for milk and meat. And this encourages people to set fires, to, to burn down the natural, the natural vegetation so that there's green grass to feed the cattle. Alau is the last town before you enter the wilderness area of Sangai National Park. With 11 expedition members, we need enough food for 10 days. to hear you so talk about what you were explaining there if you would that was really great to see my old uh, companions <laughs> there the the park rangers and the poor i uh, native americans from Lao. that was really great um yeah uh, well we were uh, there at the uh, at the edge of the world uh, heritage sangai national park there in the central part of uh, ecuador in the western uh, eastern uh, part of the Eastern Andes, we're going on expedition. So I made an expedition every month to capture, I mean, to uh, track these animals. And I had captured and collared several of the endangered mountain tapers. I was the first one to ever do that. But since then- When you collar them, explain what happens to them yeah, when you- yeah. uh, we, we just quickly uh, um, lassoed them in, um, we brought them to bay and uh, yeah, the water, uh, source and uh, we quickly uh, lassoed them and, and placed a collar on them. Uh, that was plenty loose and that emitted a signal so that we could track them with uh, radio telemetry with antennas. And we tracked them all all the 24 hours of the day for years. And uh, we, males and females, uh, a couple a uh, couple younger ones, and most of them would, were adults. And then we just learned an immense amount about their behavior, their movement patterns, uh, their uh, when they're active, when they sleep, 
uh, when how, how they go to different parts of their habitat, like mineral seeps to, uh, that are needed for uh, their survival and their favored foraging areas. So I, I just learned an incredible amount from that radio tracking. But I also did a lot of direct observations and, and um, that required a lot of hiking around and those and Andean uh, Highlanders were just incre incredibly uh, strong and and knowledgeable people. I mean, I couldn't have been, I couldn't have had. Well, they were your guides. Were they your guides, so to speak? Yeah, yeah they were my guides for sure. And uh, I couldn't have done it without their help and in, in including the, the capture and the collaring, but but they were not harmed. They were immediately released. Right. And, yeah, we want to make sure people know that and, yeah. and the purpose of doing it. Um, I noticed that some of the areas in that video where the cows were grazing, uh, it was really, you know, it was all just grass and a lot of that was even gone. Um, right. How much cattle ranching is done there? Uh, cattle ranching and sheep ranching. Yeah, oh, uh, so it's really big, just like it is here in the West. I would say sheep is more major there in the Andes, uh, but it it uh, is very devastating because they will uh, be pressured by bankers and by uh, merchants to produce more and more um, sheep or or cattle because that that's what the people consume, and then consequently uh, they end up uh, burning a lot of the forests. And and uh, and bushlands in the Paramos. That's the more land above the trees. And then that uh, the that ecosystem is very delicate and only withstands so many years of that before it deteriorates. And especially on the steep slopes, then the vital soils uh, are washed away by the heavy rains. And then soon uh, there are vast areas of the Andes where you have nothing but barren rock. You have a you have a wasteland. And it's, you know, the, the whole, the mountains are like a, a, a history book and you just look at them and you can use your imagination and say, well, this used to be a wonderful uh, high Andean forest and more land, but now it's become a, a barren wasteland. And that's true of thousands of square miles in the Andes. So yeah. this is a vital cause, you know, talk about a heroic cause, but we have to deal with our fellow humans and treat them respectfully but firmly and just say look here you know there's better ways of life so that's education your, yeah like plant-based i really stress plant-based and and i don't eat meat so i i stress their quinoa which is a quinoa is a complete food and it's native to the andes and they yeah. still raise it in their gardens and same with the the yucca or the oyuca and the oka. I mean, and, it's such a verdant uh, yeah. array there of what you could grow as a plant. Yeah, there's, there's thousands of plants and that that like the passion of uh, fruit flowers uh, that give that beautiful fruit that gives nutritious and, and very healthy juices. And, yeah. and all uh, the palm trees that have the the different nuts and um, they're just end, endless uh, uh, sources of, uh, of food they could use. But number one is we have to get the, them to understand, and, uh, and most of them do, they understand that those uh, mountain forests and paramos are their water source. And that's why my project in Northern Peru <clears throat> we, uh, we have actually saved some of the last cloud forest in Paramos there <clears throat> that have been threatened by uh, some of the world's largest mining corporations. And we have an, I have an ongoing project there and, and where our aim is to set up a nature sanctuary uh, throughout that entire area there in Piura and Cajamarca uh, states. And we're making really good progress on that. So if anyone wants to contribute, just go to my andeantaperfund.com. Which we have at the bottom there of the screen. And we're going to be repeating that information. It will be, I'm going to be posting it as well. We're going to be visiting your site, but we're getting several comments, which you haven't seen, 
oh, about great. the BLM from one of our um, one of our top fans asking about the Wild Horse Roundup. Now, uh, Tina, we appreciate your watching, and this show is about the taper. But Craig, can you just jump in for about five minutes and talk about that and what's? I know that there's a lot of activities going on right now, mm -hmm. and um, I, is there a sand basin? Sandwash Basin Roundup slated. Do you know about that? Oh, yeah, that's been ongoing, still is ongoing. Yeah, that's such a disgrace. There are so many of those beautiful horses have been terribly uh, harmed and, and even killed. And um, I understand the BLM has announced that it's not going to round up within the herd management area. However, it's continuing to round up outside the herd management area. And I think we should be very careful there because I know that often uh, the ranchers or the people who don't like the wild horses will purposely drive the horses to where they know they're going to be rounded up. So I, I don't trust that as like a, a reprieve on the roundup. No, I'm very upset about uh, that sand wash basin. You know, they give 92% of the forage there to the sheep ranchers. Uh, and it's uh, that's a, um, a typical situation. It's even more extreme than average, but that's typical throughout the West. And this um, so-called path forward is a, uh, it's a wipeout plan. And I just wrote an uh, article that was, uh, it's getting a lot of reads on the Horse Talk New Zealand. It's called Outrageous Treatment of America's Wild Horses and Habitat. And I explained that and it has a number of links and I mentioned the Sandwash Basin, but I that think- would be, it, go ahead, that, would be a, that would be a good thing for people to yeah. share out. So what we're gonna do is as soon as the show is over, we'll put that link up so you people yeah. can come on and share that out. But let's just wrap up a few more words on this because we cut a little bit off. Kelter here, I've never done this before. We have a yeah. lot to come from. Well, I really appreciate Go ahead and wrap up on it. those horses. And they're, they feel a very similar niche to the mountain tapers, keystone species. They're a, re they're a uh, restored native of North America. The horse is definitely that. And you know, uh, 2021 is the 50th year uh, anniversary of the Wild Free Roaming Horse and Burrows Act. So it's time we restore the true intent of this wonderful act, which uh, will restore ecosystems and help combat global warming and help restore the, the native biodiversity uh, through their, their acting as seed dispersers and soil builders and, and many other really things and and they're beautiful you know I'm, as i'm sure beautiful that's for sure well yeah. i do want to also tell my audience that next week we'll also be having another guest about the wild horses and i have two more guests coming up talking about wild horses getting the word out there are campaigns going on and we will keep you posted but today Great. and craig will be back to talk about it as well but today craig we're back to the taper before we go back and watch the second video let's give credit to who made that video if you would quickly. Okay, that was Sinclair Stammers. He's uh, a British uh, filmer. And I made a, a film called Esperanza the Mountain Taper, or at least I, I guided near, and was the main guide and narrator of that film. Uh, that was way back in like 1995. Uh, when I did that, and that got a lot of attention. It was on Animal Planet. And that was uh, uh, Living Planet Productions out of Bristol, England. Uh, Richard Brock was the producer of that film. And S Sinclair Stammers was the filmer that worked with me. And we just used the, the native guides there. And okay, let's watch the second clip. This Rumix. Yeah. Uh, the paper seat, this Rumix, Tolomensi. And uh, it's in the buckwheat family. But there you see a definite sprout. And this is true of many different species. You see the little hair, the root hair coming from it? One of those uh, Venera Magellanica. I'm not sure this comes right from the taper. It probably just sprung up vegetatively. A welcome break in the connection of 
tapir service is enjoyed over a hot cup of steaming coffee. Okay, here we have the rear foot of the mountain tapir, which has three toes with the spade-like hooves. Uh, it's traveling along the river. We spend a lot of time in the riverine meadow racing little curves. Uh, the front uh, feet have four spade-like hooves minus a thumb. And these are very versatile, it's a very versatile organ. They can swim, they can fly very steep slopes, dig their way into the mud. And they have been observed to eat mud, eat clay, clay-like mud to obtain minerals. And here's Ricardo, who spotted the mountain taper. And we hope to get a little closer. Great. Uh, well, those are not particular. We got to improvise. Okay, I don't speak Spanish, but I know it said that the taper were in danger of extinction. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah it said that uh, keep your distance and don't kill me. It's a very nice little poetic uh, plea for people to respect the mountain taper and respect its wonderful role there. And that was uh, Shane McCarthy, the Peace Corps volunteer that worked with me, the, the um, blonde, uh, tall guy, a very strong guy from Montana. He was very helpful, and he's the one that uh, made those plaques, put those plaques in strategic areas throughout Sankai National Park so people would learn that you're there to respect the mountain taper and all the animals there. Uh, there's estimated only to be about 2,500 of the animals in all the world, in, in Colombia, Ecuador, and a little bit in northern Peru. And as I say, my ongoing projects there are having an effect. I work with some very courageous people uh, like Alejandro Zegara, conservationist from Suyana Piura. Uh, and they they have actually risked their lives and, and they keep the ball rolling to save the mountain taper. And it's one of they risk their lives. Habitats. They risk their lives because they stand up against the big mining corporations. So they're just after money trying to plunder the last of the cloud forest to, to put big uh, open pit mines, which adult would also threaten the water source of five major rivers. So it's just kind of like obvious. And uh, we had a referendum back in the um, late 90s and 95% uh, uh, of the people rejected the mining project. So we have the law on our side. So then yeah. how did that how does that continue? Uh, if, yeah, oh yeah, we have to continue because the mining corporations continue to pressure their government to allow them to go in there and establish their open pit mines. So but we it's uh, already, the yeah. law has put, let me just try to understand, the law was put in place that it was not allowed, yet they continue to do it. They continue to do that. They continue to try and subvert the law and and the and the law of nature, which uh, honors these wonderful last remnant forests. Remember, the the glaciers are melting at a very rapid rate in per, in in Peru, and that uh, the only water source are going to be those highland forests and spongy uh, uh, paramos, what they call those moorlands. So that's the future of Peru, and then. 
because uh, in part because of our making that very clear in speeches and and radio and television programs and community gathering, church gatherings, we have instilled that as well as those, these people are very intelligent. They've been living there for, in some cases, thousands of years, the Native Americans. So they appreciate, they just want to be left alone like the mountain taper and live in harmony. And uh, we're declaring, in the process, declaring more nature sanctuaries there. We're going, we have a project to declare the Cerro Negro nature sanctuary. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to happen now because there was a new election uh, of a new president in um, Peru. His name is yeah. Castillo. And he's a conservation. He's a very enlightened, uh, relatively young man who had been a professor. And uh, I, I think he's going to collaborate. So things are looking up now. That's great. But we do need more support. Uh, for this project, and I am a member of the um, IUCN Species uh, Specialist Group, and I have an approved project to uh, declare the Cerro Negro Nature Sanctuary or Ecological Sanctuary there in Peru. But we just need uh, we need the you know a minimum of support. So anything, it's tax deductible, and my organization is in good standing, and it also. Um, it uh, defends the uh, wild horse and burros too, and that's right. Any any member of the of the horse uh, uh, taper or rhino families, and I, I offer really, really uh, I believe very uh, excellent presentations, uh, uh, powerpoints, and I give uh, offer speeches, both in English and Spanish. So uh, any anyone who would like to have me give a speech or or appear on a program such as you're doing, I'm really grateful. Uh, that helps, you know, if you can plant a seed anywhere with anyone, uh, it, it, it's good, it's positive, you know, and, and it, yes. it, will make a, it will make a difference. We really have to stand up today to save, save precious life on earth. So people can donate here on your website and they can also contact you for speaking engagements, et cetera. We have your, um, this is the address here going across the screen, but I'll add those as well as we're speaking. I'll add your address here into the uh, comments for people that want to get it right now. And uh, go ahead, keep going. Let's yes, see. I, um, I also have a project going on in, uh, in the uh, lowland uh Peruvian Amazon, where it meets the uh, Andes uh, with the Shibibo tribe. And uh, that involves the lowland or Brazilian taper, as well as all the forest there, which is very threatened now because of what's happening in Brazil. And there, uh, that Bolsonaro has been allowing unlimited destruction of the last of the Amazonian rainforest. And that's spilling over into Peru and Bolivia and other places. So right. that's a desperate need there. And I also work with that um, Samuel Cowper Pinedo, who's a uh, Peruvian biologist I met uh, some years ago in Cusco at an endangered species conference. And we collaborate as well. Uh, so I have those two projects going on in Peru, <clears throat> as well as uh, I, have, uh, I do a lot for the, the, the wild horse and burros here yes. in the United States. So you were just letting people know that you're working hard on both of those yes. issues yes. because for you, that is the same thing. It's, it's preservation of wildlife, which is precious to, to us. It should be precious to us yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and nature, vital to nature. And it all ties into the same thing, really. The horses, the tapers, uh, all yeah. the other animals, the elk, everything. It's part of a system yeah. that we are destroying and we must quickly yeah. turn that around. Yes. P people need to be much more respectful and to be uh, humble and to observe. And that's how they will learn. If they don't, I really fear for the future of life on earth. We have to learn, let the species and plants and animals show us what belongs and in what proportion and what balance 
And that way we can save life on earth. But if we don't pull in our horns in this respect, if we just continue, oh, I want this in kind of a, a childish manner, then I, I think that uh, we could see, uh, we could leave a sterile planet here because the way global warming is going now, it's very frightening. And um, I just hope we can rein it in, but that depends on us. And we have to restore the natural ecosystem and the, the species and let them restore balance and learn to live in harmony with the beautiful balanced tree and, and natural ecosystems. We have to do that, you know, and we have so much to learn from, uh, from the indigenous peoples that had did have done that for thousands of years. I did want to mention here, um, I asked you what people could do. What is the call to action? And you said that um, there are organizations they could reach out to the U S fish and wildlife fund, is that correct? For U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's part service. of the Sorry, Department service. of Interior. Thumbs yeah. are in my mind here. Yeah. We want the some Endangered funds. Species Program under the yeah. Endangered Species Act. So they have, and that includes animals and plants in foreign countries all over the world. So they can, uh, you know, enforce laws on trade and uh, on hunting, for example, and on uh, it promote uh, habitat preservation, restoration in these countries. And they can have a huge, and they do have a, a huge effect. So through the Fantastic. international programs. So any of these three, the World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, people should check out. We'll put their websites up as yeah. well. And we ask people to share out this video, as you said, Craig, Anywhere that you can go out and speak, that's going to be a good platform. You know, I have a wonderful, I have a wonderful professional PowerPoint, uh, mm -hmm. which covers all the three families: the horse, taper, and rhino families. They're all in the in the parasodactyl or odd-toed uh, ungulate order of mammals, and this is a disappearing order. I mean, thirteen of the seventeen species are on the red list of, of uh, threatened and endangered species. And, and many of them are in critical danger of extinction. And yet, yet they, are, they play a very important role. They're not cloven hoofed ruminants, but they're uh, soliped, uh, single hoofed, uh, cecal digesters. And they don't as thoroughly digest what they ingest. And consequently their droppings in rich soils, they feed soils and they feed ecosystems and they pass many more species intact and capable of germination. And anyway, I, I really well, welcome- that becomes like fertilizer, natural fertilizer. Oh, natural fertilizer, absolutely. And in, in societies where there isn't this prejudice against, uh, for example, the wild horses, they recognize that horses restore ecosystems. and. And it's the same with the tapers and the rhinos. It's been abundantly proven. And it's just basic biology. Anyone who knows the first thing about these animals and, their, and the differences and how they complement each other. And actually the tapers and the horse or rhinos, they complement the, the hoofed uh, or even, uh, even toed uh, um, ruminant digesters. They actually help them and they help they help balance out their ecosystem. And that's also been proven all over the world. So we're going to get into that even more so when we talk about your plan in a couple of minutes. But I do want to touch on one thing, and that is the indigenous people that are there and their beliefs in utilizing. And a lot of the, um, I don't know, from what I understand, I shouldn't just assume this, but it seems like a lot of the hunting is for so-called medicinal purposes. And I'm gonna show a graphic image. So here's my graphic warning. If you don't wanna see it, um, maybe look away for a moment, but come right back. So here we go. There's, they're using their snouts and their paws. Can you talk a little yeah, bit about uh, that? Spade-like hoofs. Yeah, that's right. They use, uh, they believe that they cure uh, epilepsy and they help strengthen the heart and they're general all around uh, cure-alls and tonics. And even they get into uh, aphrodisiacs and that sort of thing. But 
you know, that, that that's just terrible because when you put a monetary value on them and then people just think about, they just see money and they don't see the beautiful animal out there that's living in harmony and maintaining the beautiful forests and paramos. It, it's just a very crass and, and wicked way of looking at life. Right. Now, how do you think, what are some ways that we can re-educate people that live there? And I knew you were talking about that a little bit, but would, do you have any um, desire to go back there? Is that oh, part yeah, of it? Yeah, no, I was going to go back there uh, this past year, but because it wasn't advised due to the uh, COVID-19, but I do plan, it's uh, my, uh, my co uh, compadres down there want me to come as soon as it's possible is safe to come and, and I do I am planning to come down and visit both the projects in uh, northern Peru where we have the long and we've been victorious at saving a vast area from some of the world's largest mining corporations I want to go there and give conferences and and uh, and go on expedition I also want to go down into the uh, Andean foothill and Amazon uh, border uh, there around uh, Pulcalpa, Peru, and work with the Shibibo tribe and my friend Samuel Cowper Pinedo, uh, that fine biologist that's spearheading the movement. So yeah, no, it, but I, I keep overseeing these plant these uh, projects, and I give. I just sent uh, two two support wires down to both projects. Uh, and uh, but they they really need more. They get by on a shoestring, you know. But they do incredible things with the sl the uh, small amount of funding I'm able to send. The animals are really incredible. I was just looking at that one picture here. It's a drawing, black and white. But it did have the opportunity to see a color picture of a baby that was striped like that. Now is that is that a rare? Uh, no, that, that's rare? typical of all the tapers. They're born like a lot of animals with oh, um, wow. camo with natural camouflage. They look a bit like a watermelon, you know. I when know. Did, and when we did that uh, film, uh, Esperanza the Mountain Taper, that was a young orphaned mountain taper uh, that had that uh, spotting, and we followed her development. My my assistant biologist Armando Castellanos followed her and made a. I did a little thesis on uh, on her development. So, yeah, so they kind of like hide out. And then after about six months to a year, the dots and stripes disappear and they become oh, wow. like an adult. They generally uh, become sexually mature about three years of age and they can live up into about 15, 15 years or, or 20 years. That's uh, incredible. They're so beautiful. Yeah. And the mountain. And then there's some that are black and white, so they'll go from that to like oh, black. Yeah, and that, that's the giant. It's like a ton. That's the Malayan taper. It's the only one that remains in in Asia, uh, and it's it's really endangered because they've hunted it so much. But it's it's a beautiful animal, but it has that disruptive coloration so that it can blend in with the shadows, and uh, avoid detection, for example, by tigers because uh, it evolved, you know, for thousands of years with tigers and other predators and people too that were hunting it. But yeah, it, it's a wonderful animal. And there's a there's an effort to to save that animal there in Southeast Asia now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show the website uh, for the other organization that you work with. Um, let me see if I've got the right one. Yeah, here. The, the Taper Specialist Group. Nope, got the wrong one. Yeah, the the other group that you work with. I'm trying. Yeah, to on my on my website, there's should be links there to those uh, also. But yeah, if you go on tapers tapers dot com, it should come right up slash conservation, and it will tell about all the action plans, like in this in this book that had my oh. Uh, my mountain taper, both in Spanish and English. It also had a plan for all the other four species. But I really think there should be a plan for this new species, the Cabo Mani taper uh -huh. in the Amazon, because it could be in critical danger of extinction. And uh, there should be a lot more effort to save that one as well. 
And this is the site you were speaking about, tapers.org conservation, where yeah. people can go and get additional information. This is not your website per se, but you're part of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, an, uh, I'm a member of the, of the taper specialist group in the World Conservation Union. I've been since its founding, actually, back in the 90s. Uh huh. And so what can people find out when they come to this site? Like, what is this well, picture it, here? Yeah, they will they will find out uh, about all the different programs, whether it's the, the lowland taper over in Brazil or whether it's the Malayan taper there in Southeast Asia or whether it's the, the Central American or Baird's taper in, uh, you know, in Guatemala and Central America uh, or uh -huh. or the taper, uh, the mountain taper, too. There's some really dedicated wow. people in Colombia and Ecuador and in, in Peru that are trying to save the, the mountain taper uh, in, in, in some very rugged country. But it's really, uh, the compensation there is this, it's so beautiful and spectacular to be in these places. And there's just wow. a special, a special uh, atmosphere and vitality there. I, I greatly miss the Andes. And uh, as a matter of fact, last night I had a, I had a dream. I was back there back there in the, in the Andes and with the people wow. there in nature. And they have a virtual library on this site for people that really want to learn a lot more about it, as well as on your site, they can learn. Yeah. About. Yeah. And you know, they have a trunk and it's the same kind of trunk that an elephant has, but it's a case of convergent evolution. They actually evolved. That? that means they evolved over the millions of years. They evolved that same kind of trunk, but independently from the the lineage that led to the elephant. But they oh, wow. evolved it. And that trunk, it's a grasping organ, has like a little hand at the end of end of it. It can pick fruits. It can squirt water. It can act as a, like a a um, a snorkel. It can dive. They're all they're incredible animals. They can they're called amphibious because they can inhabit water yeah. and land both. And the mountain taper is incredible because it's also an incredible climber. It can climb very steep mountains, even actually climb similar. Now, wait a minute. When you say it goes underwater, how long does he stay under? You say they're amphibious. Uh, they they can stay under several minutes, especially the ones that live in the lowland jungle, like the Amazonian yeah. taper yeah. and the Central American taper. The mountain taper can also stay under, but probably not as long because it's evolved more in the in the uh, mountains. And it's the uh, the only one that has the thick woolly fur. The others have sparse fur that's more adapted to the, the humid and hotter um, rainforest climates. Wow, that's so interesting. And there's so much to learn about this incredible yeah, no, it's animal. It's really fascinating. It's really fascinating. And, it um, is. Yeah, you just get deeper and deeper into it, and it. Uh, but the number one is we got to save these animals right. in the wild, in their habitats. So know. that leads us right into your plan. So let's let yeah. me see if I can yeah. share that, and uh, let's talk about that for a moment. Okay. So talk a little bit about who this was written for. Give us the context while I'm bringing it up on the screen, if you would. Uh, yeah, this is uh, like probably the world's best organization that it consists of uh, all kinds of people, many professional biologists, ecologists, are just really dedicated people that, that love nature and love animals and they and they love the tapers in particular. They want to they want to see them saved and they want to see them be part of our world and they want to see their their habitats, which are mainly forest habitats, saved. Mostly they're in the in the tropics, of course. So uh, you have some of the, the like this uh, uh, John uh, Eisenberg. He's one of the mm -hmm. foremost, foremost uh, um, ecologists in the world, and and he takes a he studied in great depth. It's also uh, um, uh, Hershkovitz there at the uh, Smithsonian Institute, and there's uh, uh, Fabio Olmos who did a, a great job on their um, their great importance as seed dispersers, how they're gardeners of these forests. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then 
Right. And this was tra translated, uh, these were translated into Spanish. Like I translated all the ones that needed to be translated into Spanish, I did. Wow. So you're yeah. fluent in Spanish. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, years and years. It was just like um, second nature to me. I love Spanish. It's a very uh, rhythmic and uh, expressive language for sure. Okay, so Craig, we're running a little short of time. We have 15 minutes left, but we do want you to talk about your plan okay. and then remind people how they can you know, get in yeah, touch. The, number one is I think there's a lot of gaps in the knowledge and they're being filled. Uh, for example, where do the habitats remain in the Northern Andes? Do they still have tapers? Uh, and if, that, if not, then how can we reintroduce them and then another aspect is we got to focus on public education. We really got to get out there and beat the drum for these animals and their habitats and tell how important they are as living uh, individuals and, and groups and, and viable populations. And what is a genetically viable population? How many? It's not just, oh, yeah, we have a handful of them left, so they're okay. No, there have to be thousands of them. They have to be dispersed throughout these nations. So uh, we got to work with the big, uh, like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and the World Wildlife Fund and the Conservation, uh, World, uh, Wildlife uh, International, uh, well, Wildlife Conservation Society, the one that, that helped me and, and all, and we got to get it into the universities and, uh, and we can do it, you know, uh, and they're depending on us to, to take an interest uh, and, and, and then to introduce alternative lifestyles because we have to make the people aware that business as usual, their, uh, their traditions, no matter how long they've been going, if they're destructive, we have to change them. And there are much better ways of life. And so that really did stress the plant-based as a great alternative and leaving yes. and respecting your natural uh, refuges, your parks and ecological sanctuaries and, and, and going into ecotourism because many people all over the world just crave going into areas that are not overrun by people and civilization they real they just naturally sense there's harmony and and a lot of harmony and beauty here many people love taking pictures or just being there you know it's a very healing experience so that's another thing i i offer and others offer is i actually offer tours to take people in and um and i uh, uh, some people have taken me up on that mainly filmmakers that have have taken me up on that, but there, by my action plan, which you can get online, uh, goes into great deal detail. And uh, these people are really clever artisans. For example, in the Andes, they're great weavers, uh, great sewers and weavers, and they make beautiful tapestries. And I uh, got to to be um, real good friends with one uh, Salasakan indigenous family and became the godfather of their their youngest son uh -huh. and, and they wove a special uh tapestry showing the mountain taper and sangai national park and everything i have right in my house here wow, pretty. And there are many other things they could do they make beautiful little like little teddy bears of the mountain taper and just, or they paint them, you know, beautiful artwork. Maybe you can offer those on your website. For People can take a, a pride in, in, the, in the life community where they live. And, and I would tell them, I said, don't envy the Americans with their lavish lifestyle. You live in a paradise. You just yeah. have to learn how to, to appreciate it and, and respect it and preserve it because you really live in an incredibly beautiful and, uh, you know, charming area. So you're very, well, I think, yeah. Sorry. I think what you said is so important, educating them because once the people know that if they don't take care of it, they're going to lose everything there. I mean, their whole lifestyle, their whole way of well, living. Yeah. And, and that the helps. Way, I think making them yeah. aware of that. Yeah. Just making important. them aware and showing that you care because you genuinely do care because you've been 
and uh, they can be the watchdogs the also. Word, like, no. Pardon? Yeah. I say they can be the watchdogs for things like poachers. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You see that in Africa with the black mambas that are a tribe of women, or a force of women soldiers that are so effective. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, no, and, and often, sort of, often, often the women who really do care and have that nurturing quality. Yeah. And uh, like the tree huggers there in uh, in northern India that... Uh, Bananda Shiva, who was the Nobel Prize winner, is that her name? Anyway, I met her once, and, and she and those women actually went and hugged the trees to prevent the last forest from being sawed down. And I guess that's where the term came from. Is that what they were? Yeah, that she was an original tree hugger, and she's a became a Nobel Prize winner, and she risked her life to save the last forest in northern India from being uh, just mowed down. You know. And, and when, people, when people use that term tree hugger as a derogatory oh, term. Oh, yeah, to me, that is just pervade. so, it, should, it just. They have no it. idea that the woman that won it, that initiated that whole yeah. action won a Nobel Prize, and they're probably. Yeah, yeah. it shows such abysmal <laughs> ignorance to to mock that, you know, uh, yeah. you know, real, real wise and heroic act of saving those forests. Yeah. Does anyone have a question for Craig? We still have a few minutes left. Anybody watching have a question? We can tell you again that you can go to his website, which the information is up there, right there, uh, andiantaperfund.com, not org, .com. Take note of that if you would. And then also we've got his address if you want to write to him. You can reach him on Facebook. What's your Facebook handle? Yeah, yeah, you can go to Craig Downer or you can go to Andean Taper Fund slash Wild Horse and Burrow Fund mm -hmm. or you can go to the Wild Horse Conspiracy. Uh, I have those three Facebook page, uh, pages or sites. That's yeah, fantastic. I'm sending out a lot uh, to invite people uh, and I got some calls. So I, I hope we got a few people on. Uh, if not, you know, I can send them. To invite them to tell, to say, oh, to come on to, to watch yeah. the show. Yeah. Yes. And I do want to remind people to share this out because this show has, I like to say it has legs. We, that we broadcast now, but this show is going to go out across multiple platforms, but we need your help. If you share it out as well, imagine what, how many people will see it. This is a very important message, and I can see from your comments that you agree with us. So please do share it out, put it on your social media, and tell your friends about this because most people don't even know. Uh, maybe I'm more ignorant than most about nature, but I didn't think I was, and I never heard of a taper. I don't know. It's, oh, it's, yeah. Is that normal, yeah. or am I just like one of those? They're like the old Methuselahs of the mammal. Yeah. Plant. You know, they've just been here for millions of years, and um, actually, the early horses were very taper-like, but then they went on to develop that unique trunk. So it's not like they're just stayed stick in the muds. They actually uh, evolved, you know, along with everything else. So um, thanks so much for helping me get out the word about the Sachawagra. That's how you call them in Quechua. Sachawagra. Sachawagra. I learned some Quechua there, uh, the native language, and. By the way, the poor I Indians that I worked with have their own language, but it's a uh, it's a language that's in danger. So they're trying to preserve it to keep the young people learning that language, and that's true of many of those cultures. There it must uh, not be lost. Yeah, yeah, it can't just be you know uh, Spanish and forget your native tongue. Right. There's, there's the same the cultural wealth and. That project that I'm helping uh, oversee in the Amazon is trying to preserve their culture as well, the Shibibo Indians. And That's they've great. made a special dictionary and they've emphasized the plants and their uses and their names. So they're preserving, not only helping to preserve these uh, uh, plants and their forests and rivers, but they're also preserving their language and their culture and their wisdom. Of, of how to live with in harmony with the forest. Yeah, we just got a comment from one of our viewers, Julie um, Mora Perez, saying that she watched 
uh, taper and, and learn that they're so much like horses. That's really amazing to me because to me, they look more like an elephant anteater mix. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's something that at first glance you'd say, oh, they're quite different. But yeah, I learned that too. When you actually study them, you see they're very similar. Their movements are very similar. Their muscular muscular uh, conformation, very similar. It's I just see, yeah, yeah. developed that longer trunk, but actually the horse too, and the, the equines also have a or very- bears too. It kind of, some of them look like bears. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. They have that form, but uh, there is a bear there called the spectacle bear, and it's also an endangered species. I would see them every once in a while. They're an amazing little bear. Primarily, they're a, uh, a vegetarian bear, but they will take some animals occasionally. Um, and there are puma there, or mountain lions, and there are um, uh, fox-like and dog-like animals as well. There, there are Andean condors, huge with nine, 10 feet wingspans that glide over. Just a, a wonderful area, you know. I guess I could have spent the rest of my life there. Yeah. And I, I really want to get back there. Uh, it's a world heritage site. And I protested some violations of the park, including a road. And that became a, a cause celebre all over the world. It was called the Guamote Marcus Road back in the uh -huh. mid, mid 90s. And as a result, uh, Ecuador uh, uh, nearly doubled the size of Sangai National Park. So that wow. I can say, I know for a fact that that would not have happened had I not protested when everyone was else was just letting it happen. You know, I was, I, was, I was the guy that said, hey, this is not right. You're allowing a road in a world heritage site and in one of the, the most pristine and untouched highland Andean forests and a real mecca for the for the, the uh, endangered mountain taper. And it and so it just shows, you know, even though you think you're you're just a straw in a, uh, in, a in a storm, you can have an effect, you know. It's like a, yeah. a straw that is blown in a storm, it can pierce a brick wall if it's going going fast enough in a tornado. You ever you ever mm -hmm. seen that or heard about it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we are going to keep plunging forward on the wild horses, on the taper, on all of the wild animals that need yeah. our help and the our right, we right will right not right. destroy our beautiful planet. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. It's been a real pleasure being on, and and thank you for showing the these beautiful animals and how harmonious they are, and let, letting me be their spokesman. I'll I'll try to be uh, ever better and more effective. That's the same same thing for the wild horses and the rhinos as well. And Craig will be coming on again within another month or two. He'll be bringing us some more information. So we'll see him again. Yeah. Um, everybody, have, yeah, great. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all the wonderful comments. We're so happy you're enjoying the show. Please tune in and tell others about it and help us spread the word about animals in need. And of course, conservation, plant-based lifestyle, everything for everyone to live in peace and harmony. So on those last thoughts, let's say goodbye for today. Bye, Craig. Okay, goodbye. Amen. Great, great ending. <laughs> Thank you.